what other medication should be provided alongside treatment of uncomplicated malaria infection. The fever of malaria has been associated with premature labor and fetal distress. Prompt treatment with antipyretics, paracetamol at the standard dose, is fundamental to the treatment of fever from malaria in pregnancy. In Plasmodium falciparum malaria treatment trials, in women with low premonition, 90% of women develop anemia, hemoglobin less than 10 grams per deciliter, either on admission or during follow-up. Premunition is a degree of naturally acquired host immunity to malaria. It depends on repeated exposure to infectious anophelin bites, so most UK-based residents will have low or no premunition. Mild and moderate malaria-associated anemia is treated with ferrosulfate and folic acid at the usual doses. Does pregnancy affect the efficacy of malaria treatments? Treatments in pregnancy may have lower efficacy than in non-pregnant patients, but this apparent effect could result from lowered concentrations of antimalarials in pregnancy. Women should be advised of the risk of recurrence in a suitable follow-up plan device, for example, if symptoms or fever return, a repeat blood film is necessary. Malaria in pregnancy is unique and the ability of Plasmodium falciparum to sequester in the placenta challenges the normal way anti-malarial drug efficacy is assessed. Polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, confirm prolonged submicroscopic carriage with subsequent recurrence has been reported in pregnant women for months following drug treatment for uncomplicated Plasmodium falciparum. Most recurrence is around day 28 to 42, but late reported recurrence, so far unique to pregnancy, has been reported to occur at 85 days with quinine, 98 days with artesunate, 63 days with artemether lumefantrine, and 121 days with mefloquine. Weekly screening by blood film until delivery allows these women to be detected positive before becoming symptomatic. How should recurrence be treated? Infections that recur following treatment are likely to be intrinsically less sensitive to the drugs used against them. All the trials of recurrent malaria in pregnancy rely on artemisinin derivatives. If quinine and clindamycin has failed as first-line treatment, an alternative should be considered. Atovacoin progonial artesunate and dihydroartemisinin piperaquine have been used in pregnant women with multiple recurrent infections with good effect. The World Health Organization recommended regimen of 7 days of artesunate, 2 mg per kilograms per day or 100 mg daily for 7 days, and clindamycin, 450 mg three times daily for seven days could be given. How are pregnancy related complications of severe malaria managed? Monitor for hypoglycemia regularly as it can be profound and persistent in malaria in pregnancy and can be exacerbated by quinine. Prevent mortality from pulmonary edema and acute respiratory distress syndrome by clinical assessment of jugular venous or central venous pressure aimed at keeping right arterial pressure less than 10 cm H2O. Women who are severely anemic should be transfused slowly, preferably with back cells and intravenous frusimide 20 mg. Alternatively, exchange transfusion may be considered in centers where this can be performed safely. Secondary bacterial infection should be suspected if the patient becomes hypotensive. Severe malaria in pregnancy is a medical emergency and women should be treated in a high dependency or intensive care unit according to their condition and without delay. Hypoglycemia, pulmonary edema, severe anemia, and secondary bacterial infection are more common and severe in pregnant women. Hypoglycemia is commonly asymptomatic, 
although it may be associated with fetal bradycardia and other signs of fetal distress. In the most severely ill women, it is associated with lactic acidosis and high mortality. In patients who have been given quinine, abnormal behavior, sweating, and sudden loss of consciousness are the usual manifestations. The hypoglycemia of quinine is caused by hyperinsulinemia and remains the most common and important adverse effect of this drug. The hypoglycemia may be profound, recurrent, and intractable in pregnancy, and regular monitoring of glucose is required while under quinine treatment. It may present late in the disease when the patient appears to be recovering. Quinine at treatment doses does not induce abortion or labor. Table number 3. Supportive clinical care in severe malaria. Manifestation or complication. Coma, cerebral malaria. Management. Monitor using Glasgow Coma Score. Maintain airway. Place patient on her left side. Exclude treatable causes of coma. For example, hypoglycemia and bacterial meningitis. Hyperpyrexia. Administer tepid sponging, funning, and antipyretic drugs. Convulsions. Maintain airway. Treat promptly with intravenous or rectal diazepam. Hypoglycemia. Blood glucose less than 2.2 millimoles per liter or less than 40 mg per 100 ml. Check blood glucose regularly, correct hypoglycemia, and maintain with glucose-containing infusion. Quinine-induced hypoglycemia can occur quite late in the course even after the patient appears to be recovering. Severe anemia, hemoglobin less than 8 g per 100 ml or packed cell volume, less than 24%, transfused with packed red cells, acute pulmonary edema, possible overlay of acute respiratory distress syndrome, prevent by monitoring jugular venous pressure or JVP, central venous pressure or CVP, to keep right arterial pressure less than 10 cm H2O. Treat by propping patient up at an angle of 45 degrees, give oxygen, give a diuretic, stop intravenous fluids, intubate and add positive end expiratory pressure, continuous positive airway pressure in life-threatening hypoxemia. Renal failure. Exclude pre-renal causes. Check fluid balance and urinary sodium. If in established renal failure, add hemofiltration or hemodialysis, or if unavailable, peritoneal dialysis. The benefits of diuretics and or dopamine in acute renal failure are not proven. Spontaneous bleeding and coagulopathy. Transfuse with screen fresh whole blood, cryoprecipitate, fresh frozen plasma in platelets if available. Give vitamin K by injection. Metabolic acidosis. Prevent by careful fluid balance, observation of JVP or CVP by central venous access helps optimize fluid balance and avoids overfilling. Exclude or treat hypoglycemia, hypovolemia, and septicemia. If severe, add hemofiltration or hemodialysis. Shock. Suspect septicemia. Take blood for cultures. Give parenteral broad-spectrum antimicrobials. Correct hemodynamic disturbances. Pulmonary edema may be present on admission or may develop suddenly and unexpectedly. It may develop immediately after childbirth. Pulmonary edema is a grave complication of severe malaria with a high mortality of over 50%. The first indication of impending pulmonary edema is an increase in the respiratory rate, which precedes the development of other chest signs. Ensure that the pulmonary edema has not resulted from iatrogenic fluid overload, 
and monitor the central venous pressure and urine output. In some women, acute respiratory distress syndrome can occur in addition to the pulmonary edema. Once the syndrome develops, the patient needs fluid restriction. Severe anemia is associated with maternal morbidity, an increased risk of postpartum hemorrhage, and perinatal mortality. Women who go into labor when severely anemic or fluid overloaded may develop acute pulmonary edema after separation of the placenta. Monitor hemoglobin and transfuse as necessary. Exchange transfusion may be considered, but there is no clear evidence base. Secondary bacterial infection, principally gram-negative septicemia, has been reported. The patient is collapsed with a systolic blood pressure less than 80 mm of mercury in the supine position. Blood cultures should be taken if the patient shows signs of shock or fever returns after apparent fever clearance. Broad-spectrum antibiotics, such as ceftriaxone, should be started immediately. Once the results of blood culture and sensitivity testing are available, give the appropriate antibiotic. Obstetric management is specific to malaria infection in pregnancy. Common obstetric problems with acute symptomatic malaria, preterm labor, fetal growth restriction, and fetal heart rate abnormalities can occur in malaria in pregnancy. In severe malaria complicated by fetal compromise, a multidisciplinary team approach, intensive care specialist, infectious disease specialist, obstetrician, neonatologist, is required to plan optimal management of mother and baby. Stillbirth and premature delivery in malaria in pregnancy are best prevented with prompt and effective anti-malarial treatment. Uncomplicated malaria in pregnancy is not a reason for induction of labor. Pharmacological thromboprophylaxis should be weighed up against the risk of hemorrhage and should be withheld if the platelet count is falling or less than 100, indicating thrombocytopenia. Peripartum malaria is an indication for placental histology and placenta, cord, and baby blood films to detect congenital malaria at an early stage. Inform women of the risk of vertical transmission and in the presence of positive placental blood films that fever in the infant could indicate malaria, a blood film from the baby is required for confirmation. Common sense obstetrics applies to the management of the adverse effects of malaria in pregnancy. Efficacious and prompt treatment of malaria in the women reduces the systemic effects of paracetamia and reduces the adverse effects on the fetus, such as fetal distress. In severe malaria, cardiotocograph monitoring may reveal fetal tachycardia, bradycardia, or late decelerations in relation to uterine contractions indicating fetal distress, particularly in the presence of fever. Paracetamol 1 gram every 4 to 6 hours to a maximum of 4 grams per day is safe and effective and should be prescribed. Maternal hypoglycemia should be excluded as the cause of fetal distress, particularly if treatment is with quinine. Tocolytic therapy and prophylactic steroid therapy at the usual obstetric doses should be considered if there are no contraindications. In women with severe malaria, obstetric advice should be sought at an early stage. The pediatrician should be alerted and the mother's blood glucose checked frequently, particularly when intravenous quinine is administered. Fetal distress is common and has been related to malaria fever. Late type 2 decelerations of the fetal heart rate were recorded in 6 women before treatment but in most women, signs of fetal distress diminished as the maternal temperature fell. Standard obstetric principles apply. The life of the woman comes first. Acute malaria can cause thrombocytopenia in pregnancy. There is usually no need for pregnant women with malaria infection to receive a thromboprophylaxis. Acute malaria causes thrombocytopenia and in severe malaria, can cause disseminated intravascular coagulation. Thrombocytopenia recovers with treatment 90% by day 7 
and 100% by day 14, irrespective of the type of anti-malarial treatment. Anti-malarial drugs can clear peripheral parasitemia more quickly than that from placenta. Maternal malaria close to delivery can result in congenital malaria, which can cause significant mortality. Congenital malaria may present in the first weeks to 10 months of life. A negative placental blood film at delivery in a woman who has had malaria in pregnancy eliminates the risk of congenital malaria significantly. Placenta and cord positive blood films result in a higher chance of congenital malaria than placenta positive, cord negative blood films. Send the placenta for histopathology as it is more sensitive than microscopy for detection of placental parasites. What antenatal care after recovery from an episode of malaria in pregnancy is advised? Regular antenatal care, including assessment of maternal hemoglobin, platelets, glucose, and fetal growth scans, is advised following recovery from an episode of malaria in pregnancy. Regular fetal growth assessment is advised, and if growth restriction is identified, routine obstetric management for this condition applies. See RCOG Green Tab Guideline Number 31, Investigation and Management of Small for Gestational Age Fetus. Inform the woman about the risk of relapse, try to prevent it, and develop a clear plan with the woman in the event of symptom recurrence. Most babies born to women with infection during pregnancy will be of normal birth weight. Effective anti-malarial treatment which clears the placenta of parasites is the most important step in preventing this complication, followed by prophylaxis to prevent relapse, such as weekly chloroquine for Plasmodium vivax. The chances of recurrence are low when a woman has completed an effective course of anti-malarials. Nevertheless, it is useful for women to be aware that malaria can recur and is more likely with Plasmodium vivax or Plasmodium ovale. Should symptoms return, prompt screening by malaria blood film, preferably at the same hospital where treatment was first given, is essential. The post-malaria treatment course for women treated for malaria can be complicated by anemia, which will be detected in routine antenatal screening. The risk of preeclampsia in UK pregnant women treated for malaria is not known but may be lower than in malaria endemic countries. What is the risk of vertical transmission of malaria infection to the baby? Vertical transmission to the fetus can occur particularly when there is infection at the time of birth and the placenta and cord are blood film positive for malaria. All neonates whose mothers develop malaria in pregnancy should be screened for malaria with standard microscopy of thick and thin blood films at birth and weekly blood films for 28 days. Vertical transmission of malaria occurs when malaria parasites cross the placenta either during pregnancy or at the time of birth. In a non-endemic country, congenital malaria can be diagnosed by finding parasites in the neonate if they have not traveled in an endemic area. The reported prevalence of congenital malaria varies from 8% to 33%. Infection of the newborn can occur despite appropriate treatment in the mother during pregnancy. If the placenta is positive for parasites, weekly screening of the newborn for 28 days is useful to allow early detection and treatment of congenital malaria. Appendix number 1. Initial rapid diagnosis, assessment, and treatment of malaria in pregnancy.